All right. Okay. We're not starting until 8.30, but I just wanted to pull this up there because, again, I'm not the best at the whole live stream thing, and I just want to give people a chance to hop on because this one seems to be very exciting because who doesn't want to talk about hummingbirds? Um, so we're just going to give that a minute. I hope everybody is doing well. Compared to last time, um, I didn't realize that there was an option that made it harder for people to comment, so I think I turned that off. So if you want to comment, you're free to do so. And I do have 8.30, so I'm going to go ahead and just jump into it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today. My name is Jolene. I'm a certified songbird feeding specialist with Wild Birds Unlimited of Concord. And today we will be talking about hummingbirds, which is gonna be a lot of fun. Every summer they are the talk of the bird feeding world. So I'm really excited to uh, get into this as well. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm seeing comments this time, which is nice. Um, so yeah, I'm seeing comments. So if you guys have any questions, because again, these little birds have a lot to be discussed, feel free to drop a comment. Hello guys. Um, and I will try and answer those questions as we we go. If there's not enough time, I'll get back to you after the presentation is over. So that said, we're going to go ahead and just hop right into it. So first off, we're switching from order Paceriformes, which has most of our perching songbirds that we see in our backyard, over to order Capramulgaformes, which is probably one of my favorites. It includes night jars, which would include like your uh, whippoorwills or common nighthawks, swifts, and tree swifts. But most importantly, it holds the family Trochilidae, which is our hummingbird family. Uh, Trochilidae means without feet, because if you've ever seen a hummingbird fly, you'll notice that it's very hard to spot their little feet sometimes times they do have them and they can perch and we'll talk more about that later too. Hummingbirds themselves in this family there are over 300 different species but only about 16 of those are in North America the, the rest are all found in South America so if you ever want to go and see as many hummingbirds as possible you'll need to fly down south as well too and that's always a lot of fun there's many different and unique types of species. In this case since we live in North Carolina uh, we only have one hummingbird species that actually visits us on this side of the United States and that's the ruby-throated hummingbird, which is always a lot of fun. Uh, they are Eastern North America's only breeding species, and they do prefer a lot of deciduous woodlands, but whether that's more open area, orchards, anywhere that has flowers is where they're going to be focusing on as well, too. And good morning, guys. I'm seeing a lot of those coming through. That's awesome. For uh, records that we have, the oldest hummingbird that has been um, banded and um, basically marked, was nine years old and nine years and one month old as well, too. Again, banding processes are usually when they capture the bird um, and they're able to get a little band on its leg. They let it go through with migration and on its way back, sometimes these birds are recaptured and they're able to observe the band number as well, too, which is really interesting. Um, now, these birds are migratory, as probably quite a few of us know, uh, so we only get to experience them in the summertime. And when it comes to the ruby-throated hummingbird, you're gonna notice this orange area is where they are found in the nesting season or the summertime, right? So this yellow portion right here is where they're found in migration. So there's a little bit of overlap depending on where they're headed out in the spring or the fall. And then in the winter, which is this blue, is where their primary residency is. So that's gonna be more in um, Central America there as well too. So when it comes to identification, uh, when you do see a hummingbird, usually you know straight away. These birds are incredibly small. Most of them are only about two inches. Uh, there are some species down in South America that can be eight inches uh, tall, but that can include different types of tails and things like that as well too. But you will notice they do have a very long bill and their wings are usually pretty stiff if you ever kind of see them flapping in the way that they hold them. Now, compared to the females, the males often are much brighter. Uh, usually you can tell from a bright uh, throat patch of colors that they have, as well as, um, of course, all of the hummingbirds in general have a nice iridescence. They're very bright and colorful and noticeable, whether they are the male or female as well, too. Now, these birds do make a lot of noise. I don't know if you've ever noticed or if you've ever heard, but they have two primary kinds of sounds that they make. One is a very consistent buzzing sound. Hopefully this isn't too loud, but this is the first one. And hopefully you guys can hear that okay. So let me know if you do that well. So that's one. So you hear a lot of the buzzing on their wings. And then for the second one, um, it's more of a kind of chittering sound as well, too. So this one. Okay, 
is their primary call. Now, of course, both your males and females can kind of make this vocalization, and I hope you guys heard that well. Um, yes, okay, cool. Um, so basically, that's just another style of vocalization. So if you ever think you hear something like a bee, that could, if it's very loud, uh, loud, that could definitely be your hummingbirds. And of course, that chattering call is something to keep an eye out for. Um, and I see, let's see, there's one comment saying they're seeing fewer so far this year in our area in Illinois. I will say we're still very early on in the hummingbird season. So usually as we get later into the season, we start to get more activity too. So uh, keep a lookout. Don't like um, think that's it for the season yet. There's still plenty of time as well. So something that's really interesting that I want to talk about too is the iridescence that's in these birds. Um, obviously, they do have it all overall on their body, but of course the largest patch of iridescence that we see is on the gorget or the throat patch of the um, humming of the, oh my goodness, it's one of those things where you're ready to talk but you're not quite there yet. Uh, but basically this throat patch of feathers is often the most iridescent part of these hummingbirds. Now the way iridescence works, which is always really interesting, is it's built into the structure of the feather so that when the light reflects on it a certain way, only when you're staring directly at it are you going to see that bright coloration. When, you're, when they're in a different direction and the light is being reflected a different direction from uh, instead of dead on, you're not going to see that bright iridescent look. So it's the structure of the feather overall. So these feathers are always a bright color, but it just depends on where you're looking, which is really cool. So that's why sometimes when you're looking at your hummingbirds, they can look like they have a dark black throat because the iridescence isn't facing the right direction for you as well. Um, so that's very interesting compared to other birds that, um, like the cardinals where they eat certain types of food to get those kinds of bright colors. It's more of a structure thing versus a pigmentation, which is very interesting. Now for hummingbirds, their diet is always pretty neat. This is a mix of nectar and insects. They are one of the few birds that has nectar as the primary focus of their diet, and it does show with the type of beak that they have, as well as quite a few different structures and adaptations. Adaptations are by far one of my favorite aspects of any bird because it shows how diversified they are to better survive in their habitat and their food preferences as well. So because their diet consists of a lot of uh, nectar and everything, they do have a very high metabolism, much higher than a lot of other birds that we have, and they have to eat once at least every 10 minutes. The way that they work is they can actually lap up nectar at a rate of 12 times per second, which is a lot. And you would think that it's pretty simple in their mouth. You know, maybe they just kind of suck it through like with like a straw or something like that, but it's actually pretty complicated and really interesting. Um, the tongue of the hummingbird actually does a lot of the work. And you can see on this right picture here, this portion extending from the Rufus hummingbird is actually their tongue, right? So the way that their tongue works is it's actually connected to a hyoid apparatus, very similar to woodpeckers actually, that's in the back of the um, throat here. And what happens is it allows, it pushes forward and allows the tongue to extend much farther than the range of the beak. If you've ever seen a hummingbird eat up close, you can actually see the muscles all the way around the back because it's connected to that apparatus uh, move forward. So it actually, their tongue basically wraps around the back of their skull so that when they push forward, they have a lot of distance that they can use as well. Not only that, but the tongue itself is very interesting. So as it's in the beak, it's actually kind of coiled up, right? Their tongue is actually forked. So as it extends past the beak, it does separate into two different pieces. But not only that, is it actually is lined with lamellae or something that's kind of like a feathered structure, okay? So the tongue is kind of coiled. So as it extends past the beak, it unfurls so it has more surface area to collect the nectar, grabs the nectar, and then curls and coils up back in the mouth. Um, I'll try and attach a link that shows really good detail on this. It's super interesting, uh, but basically it makes it so that they're super effective when accessing nectar and things like that, that maybe other birds couldn't, uh, definitely other birds couldn't quite do. Uh, so it's definitely an interesting adaptation. 
Not only that, but they have a variety of other things as well too that they do. Of course, they're gonna be focusing on feeding from nectar, which is in a lot of different flowers, and there are many different styles of flowers across the world. So they definitely also have a variety of bill styles. You'll notice that, of course, with our ruby third hummingbird, it's pretty straightforward, simple, straight, thin bill. But there are others like the sword-billed hummingbird that is super long to ac access very long tubed flowers, or the lucifer hummingbird that has more of a slight arch. That depends entirely on the flowers that are the main focus of their diet. These uh, bills are very sensitive to touch and rich in blood supply, and they're actually very malleable um, than you think as well too. So just again, this middle picture of how, uh, why they open their mouth as well is very interesting. Let's see. So somebody asked, they feed on nectar every 10 minutes. Does their metabolism store the calories so they can rest at night? So the idea, and this is like with kind of any um, bird as well too, if I remember correctly, uh, basically what will happen is they're going to eat enough to kind of sustain them overnight as well. So when they do sleep, a lot of those metabolic uh, processes do start to slow down a little bit. Um, and it works out so that they can slow it down enough that they don't have to be feeding 24 seven. Kind of like how we don't need to eat all the time. We can definitely uh, go through periods of sleep. Uh, when the weather is cold enough, sometimes uh, hummingbirds do go into a state of torpor, which is very similar to a kind of light version of hibernation, where basically all of their processes slow down until it either starts to warm up or they're able to access some nectar in general as well, too. So sometimes if you notice your hummingbirds are very still and sometimes they'll actually go into torpor upside down, uh, it could be stuff like that. But for most cases, in general... Um, nighttime um, rest, they uh, their processes slow down enough for that. So hopefully that answers your question as well too. Um, so not only are their bills very interesting, these guys traded a lot to be able to access different style flowers as well. So these birds are very lightweight. Um, you know how a lot of our other songbirds usually have longer legs? These birds, hummingbirds were like, forget legs, we don't need them. Maybe feet because we have to perch sometimes, but other than that, don't need much for them. So they do have very tiny feet. Uh, basically their short legs are good for kind of hopping or shuffling, but they're not made for much else. They definitely aren't gonna do too much walking. A lot of their focus is gonna be on their wings. Now with hummingbird wings, if you've ever seen them in flight, uh, it is very interesting because a lot of our other birds, right, the, um, they'll have a tendency to flap up and down. So it's kind of that up and down motion. Hummingbirds have more of a side to side motion. So of course the video isn't slowed down, but basically the top of the wing always follows first. And what this does is it allows for the hummingbird to have better stability as they fly. They actually fly very similar to insects, uh, which provides them very good stability when they're flying forwards, backwards, side to side. They can sometimes go um, upside down if things get a little out of control. And of course, they can hover, which is not something that all of your birds do. So again, I'll try and be sure to connect a link that shows their flight in slow motion. But basically, the top of that wing is always leading first to give them better stability, which is really interesting. Um, certainly very few birds can hover, and none of them can hover as well as a hummingbird can. So when it comes to courtship, of course, like the birds themselves, it is very showy. Um, it usually starts with aerial displays performed by the male, so they'll have a tendency to do a very steep climb into the air, followed by a super rapid dive. The dive depends on the style of hummingbird, not the style, oh my goodness, the species of hummingbird. So they're not all going to dive the same way. Uh, not that it's going to be very uh, easy to see, but that's one of those things where it is specific to species. Once they dive, they end with the rapid shuttle display inches away from the female, which kind of looks something like this bird perched here. Um, basically, the fan is, the fan, oh my goodness, the tail is fanned, and you kind of see the wings out as well, too. So they basically go back and forth, showing off all of their feathers and um, obviously he wins if the female uh, enjoys the display. So 
Some of this display can also be used as an aggressive response. So it's not only just used in courtship, it's used to help defend territory. For males, they'll use it against other competing males to show them who's boss in the territory, while females will use some of the shuttle display as well to defend the nest and their meal resources too. So it can, be, it can kind of happen in both uh, male and female as well. And then let's see. Somebody has questions they don't ever see nests. Do they rest on any tree branch or do they favor deciduous or evergreens? That's a great question. We'll kind of be talking about that in a second too. Uh, so I always look forward to that as well. So when it comes to um, courtship, nesting, and mating behaviors, these birds are polygynous. So one male often depends one specific territory. In the summertime, you'll notice at your feeders that sometimes males can get very territorial, at least over on the East Coast, since we only have the um, ruby-throated hummingbird. They're very species-specific in regards to um, aggression in that kind of sense. Um, so males defend their territory from other males. Um, they'll let the females in to check things out. But once they mate, uh, the male continues defending that territory while the female goes off to build the nest and raise the young by herself. Um, so that is how their process works as well, too. So when it comes to nesting, these birds do actually return to the ne uh, same nesting area each year. So that's very similar to how hummingbirds return to the same feeding sites every year. Uh, so that is definitely possible. Their nests are going to be built on the very outskirts of pencil-sized limbs as well. So it's super small. Depending on where you live, it could be a difference between if they enjoy deciduous trees versus pine trees, but they're basically going for the teeniest, tiniest limbs available. Um, that's because, because it's so far out, it's so hard for predators to access them from that location, rather than kind of focusing towards the center of a tree or thicker branches. When these birds are so small, they don't have to utilize that. Um, that's actually a good point where I'm gonna say, if you've ever dealt with a hummingbird house, those will not work for hummingbirds because um, they don't use the houses and they focus on areas that can keep them as safe from predators as possible. Now, when the female is building the nest, it includes soft plant fibers that are very fluffy, some spider web, tree stat, basically a mix of soft and sticky, and they camouflage the outside of the nest with lichen. So when they don't want you to see it, they will not let you see it. These nests can be very inconspicuous. So basically, you're looking for a large mass of lichen on the sides, on the um outskirts of certain styles branches. So it's very tough to see them unless you see the hummingbird kind of consistently going back to like one area in your yard. So these birds can have anywhere from two to three broods. Uh, so they might nest two to three times in a season with one to two eggs, sometimes three, depending on how well they're doing. Incubation takes about two weeks, while nesting can sometimes take about three weeks. Um, so overall, it's going to be about uh, four to five weeks, depending on how well they're doing. When the young do originally hatch, they are altricial, which means they're naked, blind, and defenseless, and require entirely the parent's care to take care of them. Um, because people are awesome, Macaulay Library, again, has a lot of good resources that people post. Uh, this is a rufous hummingbird feeding its young that was hatched, I think, just that day or earlier. So you're going to notice they're incredibly small. Sometimes they, uh, they're, they're young are about the size of, like, the eggs are about the size of jelly beans, too. So course incredibly small as they feed them and of course as they sit too so you're going to notice she barely fits in that nest sometimes so they do make incredibly small nests um so that's of course younger in the process and somebody was keeping an eye on this very well because here is a hummingbird uh, juvenile much later in the nest um getting fed as well now this is the rufous hummingbird so keep in mind this is a female uh, even though she does have some spotting on the throat there, your males have a more fuller and brighter coloration too. So each species of hummingbird is different in regards to coloration, uh, but your males will be much brighter. But um, they do regurgitate some of the food there, so that is how they transfer that over to the young. Definitely, definitely an interesting process, but it's always fun to show, especially because not all of us get the chance to see the nesting sites, which is always very interesting. So once they finally leave the nest, the juveniles usually look very similar to the adult females. Um, in this case, they do have some spotting on the throat, but they don't have any of their full adult colors yet. As we get later into the season, around September and October, they uh, start to go through a preformative molt. This is when your juvenile males, who have just fledged the nest, 
start to have um, some of their adult plumage, but not quite, right? So with your juvenile males, they start to get one or two uh, red iridescent feathers in the uh, of their gorget feathers as well too, uh, but they're not quite there yet. So after they travel and migrate and they get into their wintering habitat, that's when they're gonna start to gain their um, adult plumage as well. So like I said, these birds are a major migratory species. Um, for us, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the best way to talk about this. So in the springtime, which of course we're coming to the end of, these birds start to hit uh, the United States and continue moving up for upward into North America. So they arrive in the States about late April, early May. The first ones that arrive usually go all the way up to like the northern part of the range because they have a much longer trip to go. Um, and then as it continues, then the other ones start to follow through for their nesting habitats. Um, once the nesting season is over, they start to leave back for Central America in mid-October. So we usually have them from May to October, which is a pretty good um, time of year to have them. So again, they are a lot of fun to watch. When they do migrate, the males are always the first to go and the first to leave. Uh, basically, they stake out the best territories, and once their job is done, they fly back to um, their wintering habitat because they don't really need to stay there for anything else. And then um, once the females and the juveniles are settled, they are the ones that migrate last as well, too. Of course, my... Uh, I'm sorry. Of course, with uh, migration, it's important to stock up on fat reserves so you have the energy to make these larger trips. So they do double in body weight at this time before they fly back. Uh, there are rare overwintering birds that do stay on the East Coast. It's probably more common in the West Coast because they do have more... Um, kind of not as cool temperatures in the winter sometimes. So it does depend on species. There was a Rufus hummingbird that was overwintered in Raleigh um, in the kind of Durham area, I think this past year. And there are a lot more overwinters on the coast as well, but it really isn't super common. And we'll kind of talk about that in a minute as well too. If you're curious about following the hummingbird migration, Hummingbird Central is a fantastic resource that basically um, tells you when hummingbirds have been spotted and where, what location, what species. Um, it's super interesting. And this is honestly like a huge event all over the States to kind of follow and track their behavior and all over North America too, just cause it's so fun to observe. Uh, let's see, somebody asked, will the smoke from Canada affect their migration? Um, I'm trying to think, I am not like, I would say I'm not the most informed in that regard on that subject. I would think a lot of them did migrate through um, before a lot of that kind of happened. Uh, whether or not that affects their nesting habitats, it would probably affect them as much as the other birds in the area, I think. So if it's really an issue on how much resources is available, so like if the smoke is causing issues in like insect populations or nectar availability, then they would kind of find different locations. But if it is something where it's causing some issues, but overall a lot of their other habitat stays the same, I don't think it's going to affect it too bad, but, um, I couldn't answer anything in confidence because you never know how natural um, natural behaviors like that can affect things as well too. Uh, let's see, somebody also asked how you remove them from a garage. Okay, so just in general, when you have a bird enter the garage, your best bet is to make, if you have any windows in your garage, um, cover them up so they're as dark as possible so that the only light source is coming from the outside of the garage. If you have a hummingbird feeder, you can hang that from the garage door a little bit lower and you can kind of just hope they, uh, hope they kind of go for the feeder and start to figure out where that light source is and kind of remove them that way. Um, it's very tough because they are very small, but basically enticing them and showing them that there's only one way out can be very helpful, but sometimes it takes a little bit. So good luck if you ever, if you ever have to deal with that as well too. So when it comes to feeding your hummingbirds as well too, um, again, that's a big thing to do in the summer. So I'm just gonna give a little bit information on that as well. So first off, you can make nectar at home. Um, and of course it replicates the nectar made in flowers and all that stuff as well too. It's a one to four ratio. It's one part white table sugar to four parts water. Um, definitely feel free to make this at home. If you make any excess, uh, 
past what can go in your feeders, you can store it in the fridge for up to two weeks. Basically, you just want to make sure there's nothing floating in there like mold or um, anything like that as well too. You don't want to use any brown sugar, honey, or artificial sweetener. Uh, brown sugar and honey either have too high of iron levels or have a lot more bacteria than the humming hummingbirds can handle. And artificial sweeteners don't have any of the nutrition that they need. So stay away from those. White table sugar is completely fine. And then you want to also avoid red dye. Uh, just like how it's not good for us, it's not good for the birds either. If you have a brightly colored feeder or something that you know your birds have gone to every year as a hummingbird feeder, then you don't need to worry about any, like if you don't have a lot of coloration on your hummingbird feeder, as long as they're using it, it's all good. Um, but bright colors like reds or purples or yellows or whichever, anything like that is stuff that they are used to going to. So there's no need to have that um, red dye in there. Let's see. Okay, so somebody has a feeder, but they never see them till the end of uh, till the end of August. Do you have any idea why? Okay, give me one second. I'll definitely talk about that as well too. So, as we get into the warmer summer months, as things get hotter, things can ferment very quickly. So you're going to want to change the nectar every two to three days in the hot summertime. Definitely check it on the regular to make sure you're not seeing any mold or any fermentation, any insects kind of just laying around in there, because that can drastically impact the hummingbirds as well. So hummingbird feeding can definitely be more of a higher maintenance feeding style if you're not quite ready for it. If you do have any issues with changing out the nectar um, like that regularly, there is a nectar defender, which helps keep the hummingbird nectar fresh for one and a half to two weeks. I use that, but sometimes I still change it out once a week just to make sure I'm keeping it fresh for sure. Uh, but that definitely does help, especially if you're going away and don't have the option to change it as well too. Okay, let's see. What should we use to clean our feeder that won't hurt the hummingbirds? Um, honestly, soap and water is completely fine. So like cleaning feeders in general is very good. So whether it's humming, hummingbird feeders or other seed tube feeders, hopper feeders, stuff like that, soap and water is always good, whether you use Dawn dish soap or any other kind. Basically, you're removing all of those smaller bacteria and other things and then sanitizing it um, to just in general. If you ever wanna do that with any of your feeders, one part bleach to nine part water um, is totally fine to sanitize it and then you kind of rinse it out as well too. But overall, dish soap is completely fine um, to kind of clean that up as well too. Let's see, okay. And then, all right, so give me one question. I'll definitely come back to these questions. There's a lot of good ones. You guys are so great today. Um, so with feeder options, there's two primary styles of hummingbird feeders, one of which is a bottle style where the bottle is basically overhead of the ports where the nectar um, is, um, where the hummingbirds can access the nectar. And there's also the high perch style as well too. As long as you are able to clean your hummingbird feeder and you get good activity with it, then that's all fine. I will say the bottle styles can have a tendency to leak because if they ever lose their seal, then sometimes they won't work as a vacuum. It'll just kind of drip nectar constantly. Or if you ever tilt that kind of feeder, it does lose a lot of nectar very quickly. Um, high perch feeders can usually have the nectar Oh my goodness. They usually have the nectar stored in the base of it, so it doesn't have a tendency to leak as frequently. Um, the high perch gives you good access to seeing your hummingbird all the way around, which is really nice, versus um, the one time they go behind the bottle and you can't see them because you know that's totally what happens. Um, and also with certain styles, especially with our hummingbird feeders, there are a lot of accessories and ways of keeping out ants, bees, and wasps if that are ever, oh my goodness, if that is ever an issue as well too. Um, so keeping that in mind can be very nice. More functional feeders are easier to clean in my opinion, uh, but glass ones are also fine as long as you have the right brush as well too. If hummingbird feeders aren't your thing, but you still wanna offer a really good option for your birds, um, some native plants, which are great because they're not gonna overtake your other plant species uh, that are good for North Carolina, include wild columbine, coral honeysuckle, and speeded spotted bee balm as they kind of uh, bloom during certain portions of the year. So they'll be helping throughout the year for your hummingbirds in general. Let's see. So when it comes to um, the end of migration, Basically, you can start to take your feeders down two weeks after the last hummingbird sighting as well. So in this case, um, you want to give your migrants that are farther up north more time and more resources as they pass through as well, too. Um, 
So wait until that last siding to go ahead and take your feeders down. And you definitely can just because um, the thought that if you leave them up, they're definitely going to overwinter is false. So basically they know when to leave based on uh, daylight and temperatures and things like that as well too. So definitely um, don't hesitate to kind of take them down when you've noticed a lack of activity there. So for those that are coming in store, we do also have a coupon code as well, $5 off a $25 purchase of, or more as well. So that's available today or in store as well. So you've got that option. And we do have a second viewing of this presentation. So if you know anybody in the area that is interested, uh, they can definitely check this out as well too. These are the resources that I used. Again, Macaulay Library is a fantastic resource because it just shows the different sounds and calls and photos. If you ever need to get a better idea of what your birds look like, anybody can upload to there, which is super awesome. So these are the resources there. All About Birds is a great option as well for more information on specific species. Hummingbird Central is where I had that map that you can basically see um, where your birds are at at that time. And then also some fun videos are included down here, which I'll try and include the links as well too. Um, so that's all there as well. Let's see. Um, so somebody said, I have a feeder, but never see them till the end of August. Do you have any idea why? Uh, depending on where you live, um, if it's farther north, depending on nesting season for them, usually activity is pretty slow right in the beginning of nesting season. So for us, even though they pass through May, um, they don't really start to pick up in activity until June or July for a lot of people. So it's not super uncommon. So it does depend on location. Um, so it's really kind of when they finish nesting. So just make sure you're keeping that nectar fresh. Um, and everything like that. And sometimes that's the big difference there. Um, let's see. Does their migration take months to arrive in Central America? I wonder how many miles per day they can cover. I don't know how many miles it takes uh, per day, but they can definitely cover quite a lot. If anything, I know there are migration maps as well too. So if you look online on migration, um, on the, oh my goodness, the uh, Hummingbird Central, you might be able to see how fast those things pass through, but I actually don't know too much in that regard. Uh, somebody asked, is boiling the, the nectar necessary? Um, in this case, that depends on your own water supply. If you're comfortable with drinking it, then that's completely fine. Boiling the water basically helps the um, nectar dissolve faster. So if you're that concerned about the water that you have, feel free to, um, Basically, if you're concerned about water, water quality, boil the water for five minutes. Once it's been boiled, you can go ahead and add the sugar water in and that sh or the sugar in, and that would not be a problem as well, too. Let's see. What is their temperature range? We are in the NC Mountains. One was here at 23 degrees. Whew, that is definitely cold. So for that, again, like I said, they're going to follow daylights, uh, like daylight timing and everything like that to figure out how they're migrating. Um, when it drops to temperatures like that, I, like I did mention, they will hit states of torpor as well. So that's when they slow their metabolism down um, enough to like basically kind of graze by in that sense. Um, so as long as they still have access to nectar and things like that, they can do pretty well. I'm not sure specifically on what their like final low temperature can be as well too. Um, but uh, that is an option as well. So basically, if you if you do have an overwintering hummingbird, basically offering nectar and maybe having like some kind of heating system attached so it doesn't freeze in cold temperatures can be very helpful for that as well, too. Um, can you use distilled water? Yeah, that wouldn't be a problem. Um, let's see. I heard that a dab of men mentholatum, men I'm not sure how to pronounce that, on the bottom of feeders keeps the bees and wasps away. I cannot confirm that. I don't actually know. Usually a lot of uh, feeders have some type of accessory that's a bee guard that basically makes it so that the port is so small that your bees and wasps can't access it, but your neck, uh, but your hummingbirds can. So like, for example, our bird feeders, which are like the high perch style, they have the option to add a nectar guard tip, which basically keeps out your bees and wasps that way. I usually find that as a safer option because I, I don't actually know how certain things will impact other birds. Because the worst part about feeding anything or choosing different ways to protect against one specific thing is how it can affect like 
different animals and wildlife. So like, for example, greasing the pole to keep your squirrels off. Yeah, okay, that does a great job of keeping your squirrels off for a bit. But when they go wipe themselves off, sometimes they do that in a water source where birds are also bathing and that oil affects their feathers and all that kind of stuff. So there's more to kind of think about in that regard. Um, how long does it take for the birth of a baby hummingbird? In that case, so it's that two week incubation period. So once they nest for about two weeks, then that egg hatches. Um, and then they, they start to feed it and maintain it and help it grow for the next three weeks there as well too. Are hummingbirds afraid or deterred by wind chimes? So like any bird, they feed by sight. Um, anytime you put something new or they investigate by sight too. So any anytime you put something up that's new, uh, they will be like, hey, what is that? And they will investigate it and definitely check it out. If it's in the same area for a while and it doesn't do anything, um, they're usually fine with it. I don't know because they are so small, depending on how large the wind chimes are, if that would affect them as well. Um, but over time, if something is there consistently in the same spot for a long period of time, they're not usually bothered by it. If you know they're nesting in a certain area and you try and add something new while they're there, I wouldn't recommend it because I do want them to be comfortable during that entire nesting period. Oh my goodness. Okay, I think... I got through them all. I'm sorry for some of them I wasn't super informed on. If I get any more information, I will try and respond to that a little bit later and in more detail. Um, but yeah, they're definitely, you guys had a lot of very good questions that are very specific as well too. So hopefully I was able to answer most of those uh, for what you're thinking as well. Okay, one more question. Does the male help incubate the eggs too? Very informative. Okay, so, and thank you. <laughs> so the male hummingbird, basically, he guards the territory, mates with the female, and that's pretty much it. So his focus is on food and um mating like with as many different birds as possible because that's like their job. The hum female hummingbirds are the ones that build the nest, incubate the eggs, raise the young, and then also fly with them after, um, oh my goodness, after they fledge the nest as well too. So the female is definitely primarily in charge of all of that care as well too. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully I answered everything in detail there. And again, I will try and go through these and let you know as well more information too. Um, and again, these fun videos kind of are very good for talking a little bit more in detail about what I've discussed as well. So, oh my gosh, that was a doozy. There's like 60 of you. Thank you guys so much for stopping in. I really appreciate it. Um, oh, there's one more thing. Okay, this is, this is it. This is the last one. Can you talk about praying mantis around your feeders? Okay. So if you don't know, sometimes occasionally praying mantises can cause an issue around hummingbirds because they will actually you uh, they will kill a hummingbird and actually eat a little bit of it because that's a good part of their diet. Um, hummingbirds are very small. So sadly, they are a prey option for many. Um, this is not a super common behavior, but it happens enough that it's a thing that people know. Um, so if you happen to see a praying mantis on your hummingbird feeders, just pick them up and put them somewhere else. And if you ever see them again, just pick them up and put them somewhere else. They're tiny. It's going to take them a while to get there. Um, but it does occasionally happen. Um, so... <laughs> All right, I will leave it there. I will comment on anything else in the in the comments later. Thank you guys so much for um, listening as well. I really appreciate it. We do these um, the third Saturday of every month. So if you're ever interested in learning about other species, we'll be here. So uh, we also have a YouTube channel on previous presentations too. It's ac accessible through our website as well. So thank you guys very much. Hummingbird season has just begun, so give it plenty of time. Keep your nectar fresh and keep your eyes open for any hummingbirds that might be stopping by. So thank you very much. You guys have a great day, and I'll see you next time.